G'day everyone, it's Warren here from NQ Explorers. Today we're going to have an in-depth look at the Garrett Apex Metal Detector and look at some of the features that you can utilise in this machine to maximise your success. Let's get cracking. OK, well here's the uh, Garrett Apex. We'll just have a look at the uh, features of the machine before we turn it on and look at the settings. It's a very lightweight machine, it's just over a kilogram. Uh, this tiny little control panel, which is beautifully manufactured, has a lithium-ion battery in it. Uh, on the back here you have a, um, a splash proof uh, plug for the coil, you also have a micro USB charge port and a uh, jack for a headphone, but it does come with uh, Garrett Wi-Fi um, Z-Link system. So you can buy it two ways, it comes as is or you can get it with the uh, Z-Link headphones, the MS3 headphones. Standard Garrett sort of build, very high quality, made in uh, Garland, Texas, I've been to the factory, lovely people. It's just a beautiful machine. You'd be you'd be familiar uh, if you'd used any of the Garrett machines with the um, telescoping um, stem. You've got these cam locks, and you can adjust the length. Uh, I've got the optional uh, five by eight uh, ripper coil on there. It comes with the larger um, radar. Uh, Big pardon. Comes with the larger uh, viper coil, which is good for searching large areas. But it's also narrow enough to give good uh, target separation. Uh, as I said earlier, it's splash proof, it's not waterproof, you can't submerge it, you can't submerge the coil. Um, build quality is excellent. You've got these are aluminium alloy shafts, they're all made in the US, um, and it's an epoxy uh, cast coil. Uh, one of the improvement Garrett's made over the years to the heads, uh, the, um, the armrest is this is these reinforcing ribs. Uh, very robust, and you've got a little rubber rest there and a retainer strap with a Velcro. Uh, a holder so you can adjust it the size of your arms. They've gone to this new rubberized grip which has uh, replaced the old um, foam style grip. This is really nice. It's just got a nice uh, soft touch feel to it um, and it's a very comfortable machine to use because it's so lightweight, beautifully balanced and everything's uh, easily accessed with uh, thumb controls and uh, all your uh, controls are labeled clearly in English. Okay so what is it? This is a VLF metal detector very low frequency metal detector. The very low frequency band from 3 to 30 kilohertz. Uh, it operates uh, by sending a constant wave, it's also known as a constant wave metal detector, from the coil it's constantly transmitting and receiving. Uh, so you can have a concentric or a double D coil on it. Uh, you can't really put a mono loop on a um, VLF machine because that's the domain of a pulse machine because it's switching on and off. Now all these multi-frequency metal detectors are VLF. Technically when the uh, frequency pings above 30 kilohertz it's an LF metal detector but they're VLF machines. Um, now you've got four frequencies that are selectable 5, 10, 15, 20 kilohertz and two additional settings which are multi-frequency and multi sol Now they're operating on multiple frequencies other than and beyond the 5, 10, 15, 20 kilohertz. That's a Garrett uh, information. I don't know what frequencies they go to like most companies, they don't release that sort of information to the public. So, uh, multi-salt and multi-frequency are operating within, around and above those frequencies. So it probably does go above 30 kilohertz. I'm pretty sure it does um, from the way it operates in the gold fields. Um, so it becomes an LF detector, but essentially it's a VLF constant wave metal detector. Okay, very simple to switch this machine on. Everything's thumb controlled. Turn it on. The machine's looking for the uh, Z-Link headphones, I haven't got them with me, I'm using uh, the internal speaker so you can hear what's going on. Uh, as you can see I'm set in relics mode, my battery's fully powered, it's an internal lithium ion. I've got seven points of sensitivity. Okay, now this is the main menu button and we'll just scroll through the uh, menu items. So you've got sensitivity which you can adjust, volume goes to eight, iron volume which is also up to eight, frequency where you can change from multi, multi-salt, 5, 10, 15, 20 kilohertz, and then you press the operate button to keep going. Channel is used for uh, uh, negating interference from EMI, I'll show you a bit about that later. Then you've got a backlight for night hunting, and you can switch your headphones on or off. Now we've got a nice big display screen with large target IDs in the centre, um, very good quality, it's, uh, it's splash proof, it's not uh, waterproof. Um, nice. Uh, rubberized soft touch buttons, these are last years and I've had this out in blazing heat and also freezing cold and it never never let me down. Um, 
It's uh, well labelled and it's easy to read. Uh, we're actually using English here, not uh, international symbols, which is all good. And uh, there's a various modes you can operate in when you're out in the bush. So what are those modes? Okay, let's scroll through the modes. Here they are, they're all displayed on the left. So we'll start at the top. Zero, all your pixels are lit, you're not discriminating anything. If I move through to the next mode, coins, you can see I've taken out most of the iron and dangerously close to uh, small gold. <laughs> Uh, then we've got US coins, which uh, takes out the uh, ring pulls. I don't tend to use that, but it is valid in Australia in a way, but I don't like to discriminate that notch because there are things in there that I want to find, such as small gold rings and fine gold chain. Okay, jewellery is a, uh, another mode where you're actually uh, using uh, more of your iron discrimination. I, I had, uh, in generally in relics, doesn't matter where I am, uh, unless I'm specifically look looking for iron targets. And then, of course, you can customise it and program it by dropping or adding notches. Now the Apex uh, features five different audio tones which is up from the three on a general uh, Garrett AT machine. I love that. The more audio tones the better. <laughs> so it's got a low tone for the iron range, uh, a, a low medium, a medium, a high medium and a high. And the tone break points, I'll put it the, uh, I'll, I'll subtitle the uh, tone break points. Um, they are adjustable on the lower end, on the iron end and they make a real difference to your detecting because uh, you're not looking at the screen all the time you can actually just run on your tones if you like um, de depends on your technique of detecting but uh, the five audio tones really enhances uh, the detecting experience to me and gives me a lot of information about the target I'm about to dig Now let's look at ground balancing in the Apex but uh, well, ground balance is very simple. It's an automatic ground balance. You can see this is a ground balance button. Hold. I'll just demonstrate a ground balance number here where I am. Pumping the core about two inches off the ground. That's a high, that's a fairly high ground balance. This is and this is a, a loamy soil uh, in an army camp. I'm not in the gold fields. 84. Okay. What about ground balance? This machine has 175 points of ground balance. That's more than on a Garrett AT Gold, which is a dedicated prospecting detector. And the beauty of this is, uh, there's a there's up to the, up to the point of 75 ground balance points. So 0 to 75, it's in single uh, increments, and then from 75 to 100, it's in quarter number increments. So that means all the ground balance tuning is on the high mineralized, if you like, gold fields end of the spectrum. So from 1 to 75 you go up in one number increments, from 75 to 100 actually in quarter increments. So you know this means that when you get at a ground balance of 90, uh, when you're ground balancing the machine, whether it's on uh, you know a highly mineralized soil, which could be quite variable, there's a quarter increment above every uh, above 90. So you got 90, 90.25, 90.5, 90 90.75, 90 91. It can tune that finally to a ground balance value. Now, of course, uh, ground balance does vary as you move around. You have to use the ground balance a lot uh, in a gold field situation. But here, I don't have to do that. If I get a little bit of chatter, I'll, I'll, that's the first thing I'll do is check ground balance. Always check ground balance. Stay on top of your ground balance, whatever you're doing. Uh, and this machine has a very high resolution ground balance, uh, just like an AT Max. OK, the next thing we're going to look at is iron audio. This is a great feature on these Garrett machines. It's on the AT range, it's also uh, on the Ace range. Very, very good on this multi-flex Ace Apex. Uh, what it does, it allows you to hear the iron and the good targets at the same time, but you can adjust the volume of the iron so that it's nice and low and it's a background noise. Now any experienced relic hunter is, is going to want to hear iron. You may even want to dig it if you're looking for old, you know, iron stirrups and horse tack. Um, but if you're looking for desirable targets, you need to know the, the extent of the artifact scatter. It may be a World War II camp, it may be an old homestead site, a pioneer site, a, a Cobb Co chain station. But you need to know the extent of the, uh, the activity 150 years ago. And the way you do that is by listening for iron. Because iron will be everywhere. The old tobacco tins, the old um, matchbox cases, the old wax vest is all in uh, iron tins, or tin. So that's now spread everywhere and it's degrading. Miners boot heels, all those iron objects. Iron was extremely well used, almost as much as lead. 
and it's everywhere in the old camps. The good targets are going to be in amongst the concentration of iron. So you need to know where the iron is. You leave your iron audio on to determine the uh, extent of your settlement and then you move in and you take out your good targets. So you need to use a small search coil in that circumstance. At the moment, there's, uh, as I make this video, there's three coils available for uh, Apex. The uh, standard Viper that comes with the machine when you purchase it, and the optional Ripper 5x8, and the 11.5 Raider. Now there are more coils coming, but just remember that the, uh, these coils are multi-frequency coils. Um, they look the same as the other AT and Ace coils, but they are not. Um, and they're not compatible with any other machines, just the Apex. So as more multi-frequency machines come available and as more coils come on for uh, Apex, uh, they'll all be available in this range and it'll really open up your options for detecting with this machine. Okay, one thing uh, to keep in mind with metal detecting, if you get a lot of false signals and you've got a lot of chatter you can't control, it can often be EMI, electromagnetic interference, which can come in the form of uh, your power lines, uh, high tension lines, uh, radio waves from TV and microwave transmitters, mobile phones, and other metal detectors. But with the Apex, you've got a system whereby you can actually change channels within the, uh, all the different frequency options to avoid the effects of EMI. So let's look at some ways you can uh, reduce the effects of EMI on your detecting. So if I just go into the settings here. Now, as you can see, I'm in multi-frequency. But if I'm getting some EMI or uh, any interference or chatter, I've got channel change here, so I've got eight channels I can select to quiet the machine down. It's quite, uh, it's st very stable at the moment, so um, what I'll do, I'll get up near some power lines if I can. I'll put, try to pick some EMI up. Look, the machine's well shielded, um, and you just press operate again. The machine is well shielded, so um, it's not really an issue most of the time. But if you get close to any under power lines or possibly another detector, well, Colleen's not far from me, and she's also in multi-frequency. I'm getting no interference from her. She's far enough away for them not to be an issue. But your other options are go off your multi-frequency. So you might want to go to uh, 5, 10, 15, or 20 kilohertz. And then once again, you can scroll down again, and now I'm on 20 kilohertz, and I've also got the eight channels available to me that uh, can negate the effect of any EMI I'm getting. And once your chatter uh, settles down, you make sure you're ground balanced and then you can just um, adjust the machine again and go back into your um, favourite settings, whichever they may be, multi-frequency. And of course, if you're on the beach and you're in multi-salt, same applies. There's quite a few beaches uh, that I've been to where there is a lot of EMI because there's so many people and there's a lot of uh, power lines and uh, transmitters on beaches because they're popular places. Um, I'm talking about, you know, surf beaches um, where you might want to use uh, your channel settings to change any chatter you're getting in multi-salt. I'm just going to demonstrate that channel change. Colin's in multi-frequency, I'm in multi-frequency, it's awfully noisy. Let's go down to channel. One channel change, and it stops the interference on both machines. What an awesome feature. And I just go back to operate, nice and quiet. So the next thing you might consider on the Apex is target response, both audio response and digital target ID display. And what you will find is, as with most metal detectors, you can actually work a signal up into the machine. The discriminator will make an initial assessment of what you've detected. So basically it sends back a signal, oh, that's so and so, it might only be a one-way target, it might be a very clean target, but if it's an iffy signal, uh, if you keep swinging on it, you can find you can sometimes work the machine up on the signal and you'll start to get a repetitive target ID as the discriminator actually decides what it's doing. Now on the Apex it's very very quick, it's lightning fast. If it's a good target generally you're in no doubt about that. But if you want to uh, go into these um, sites that have been well detected and dig the iffy signals, you'll find that one, as you take a bit of dirt off, the signals always improve, but even with an iffy signal, if you're only just getting a one-way signal but it's a hit, you've got to dig it. And even if it's uh, beyond the uh, ability of any machine to give you a digital target ID, you'll still get an audio. So you're getting a nice faint high tone audio or medium high tone audio. Uh, target ID's jumping all over the place, could be even down in the 20s. As you take off a bit of soil and move your coil around side to side or bring it around 90 degrees, you can actually find you work the signal up to a decent target ID because what's happening is the discriminator is deciding, it's seeing more of the target, you're giving it more information, and the discriminator will give you a much more accurate uh, ID on the screen. 
it'll still be good on the audio. So you can actually, I've actually dug and found good depth silver coins just on audio. And the target ID isn't really good until you get right on top of it. Principally because of the weight's laying in the soil, or it could be uh, ground conditions, mineralization, there's all sorts of variables in metal detecting. That's why anyone who gives you uh, an absolute depth on any machine slash coil combination on any given target, it's just rubbish because uh, there's so many variables out in the field that uh, you just cannot make a depth prediction on any machine. Okay, another critical thing about metal detecting, not just pertinent to the ACE apex, but to all metal detectors, is swing technique. There's no use swinging these big smiley faces where you cause right up in the sky at the end of your swing. That's obviously inc increasing the uh, depth uh, to the ground from the search coil, and so any deep target you're just not going to hear at all. And also it's changing your ground balance. Now that's critical for gold, but also it is for relics. If you're ground balanced on the ground, where you ground balance the machine and you're searching it one or two inches above the ground or on the ground, you bring the coil up to six or seven inches while you're out of ground balance and you'll get chatter and you may get false uh, tones at the end of your swings, particularly with a pulse machine. But I'll just demonstrate that here with this apex and this little coil. So I don't want to be doing this sort of thing. And you do see a lot of it. You want to be doing this. That's where you've got a search coil cover. I'm actually scraping that machine on the ground where it's practical, and it is practical here. And this small coil, so you wouldn't get in amongst the trees and this sort of business. But none of this, there's no use walking through the bush like that. Look how much air I've got into the coil. You want to be down there on the ground. Deep targets are going to present themselves with a, with a clear target ID and a clear audio signal. Not if you're up in the sky though. And even with a big coil, do this. You will on occasion use a very large coil, I have in the past, uh, where you've got deep grass such as up in there and uh, really the grass is impeding your uh, ability to get to the ground so you can't actually do what I'm demonstrating here. Well with a big coil you can hover over the grass and uh, you're still going to compromise depth but it'll, it'll give you an advantage over a small coil in that situation because up in there in that long grass this little coil I need to actually punch into the grass and it's not going to be possible and there's even some lantana in there which is uh, a, real, a real problem but that's critical swing technique settings and swing technique doesn't matter if you've got the best uh, metal detector on the planet it's all about the operator now there are other numerous techniques that you can uh, utilize when you're on your, your detecting trip uh, to maximize success uh, if you have a look at the a, uh, card up in the top of the uh, video now uh, there's a link to a video I did on uh, detecting hunted out sites. That'll give you tips about where to look on a site that's been heavily detected for several years and uh, may lead you to get a little bit of an advantage and to pick up some nice targets. Right, well, what we might do now is go and do a bit of detecting and uh, see if we can demonstrate some of the features that we've mentioned. Okay, I've got a good target here, I believe. It's sort of an 80, it's an 83, but look at that, I've got, I've got that ripper coil. I'm actually scraping it on the ground, that's where you need a coil cover. Yep, 83, 84. It's uh, in about there. Let's just check it and see if it is within pinpointer range. Now look at that, it's not. That's interesting. So that 5 by 8 ripper in multi-frequency is punched down below the depth that the pinpointer can reach. And also you might note the soil's quite moist of it. Uh, oh, we had a couple of inches of rain through here probably about a week ago. And occasional showers topping it up so Things are nice and moist to get good penetration from the machine. So let's just take a little bit off. Go live the whole painful process here. Okay, now we're starting to pick it up. 
in there. Could be a good recovery. Let's check we're on that right spot there. Yeah, that's the high tone on the uh, on the five tones that are on the apex. Very high tone there. Consistent 83, 84. Look, I, pre I think this is going to be a little silver coin. This is kind of a a bit of a swale and an embankment next to an old army road. Got to be a bit careful now. You can see I'm through the topsoil. The colour of the soil's changed, so that's probably where the target's going to be on the bottom of the topsoil, where you've had you know 70 years of deposition. Tree roots are encroaching on this poor little fellow that's buried down here, whatever it is. <laughs> I guess we're about to find out. Okay. And that's a coin. It's not silver. Very high tone. It's going to be a halfpenny. An old Aussie half a penny. And colloquially is a halfpenny. Nice on this embankment, nice and deep there we've got good depth out of that up in the silver range, but that's typical of these halfpennies because they're very good quality uh, copper bronze alloy ok, I'll give it a clean and we'll get a date off that right, well that's pretty crusty, it's got this. there's a bit of a clay content in the soil and it's stuck to it there, as you can see um, I don't want to clean it too much while it's wet because uh, I can't see a date, so what I'll do, I'll clean this when I get home, we'll take some still shots. Okay, there's Colleen over there. You might just see her. She's a bit camouflaged with her apex. She's got the standard viper coil on. Past that scrub turkey's mount. Actually, I just saw the turkey. I sort of chased him off when I walked up here. Gave him a bit of a fright. But he'll come back, or she, I guess it is. Unless the males are the ones that look after the nest, like emus. Anyway, so what I'm doing is uh, detecting this swale. That little berm is part of the army road, which is to the left there, and all that regrowth. It's grown since uh, the army left in 45. This swale, I mean multi frequency. Uh, back there, you can see a stump that's been taken off during World War II when I got that halfpenny just there. And here, I've got another similar signal. What's this? On the side of the swale. Eighty-six, eighty-seven. 87. I like the sound of that. We've got a bit of dapple sunlight coming through now. I hope you can. Uh, see through the contrast so this drain I mean I've been to this site many times never actually detected the drain okay as soon as you're getting it there I've got the pinpointer in uh, its least sensitive mode I'll tell you why in a minute well, we'll just dig this first and see what we get see how soft and moist the soil is we get lovely penetration today with that uh, 5 by 8 in multi and great target separation because of the size of the coil. I mean, the Viper is just as good, but it's slightly larger for covering more ground. That's what Colleen's strategy is today. Eighty-seven, eighty-eight. Well, I could, I could be jinxing myself again, but I, this could be silver. This one. Just need this grass eddy. It's in the front of the hole there. Take it back nice and gentle with a prospecting pick. Lovely loamy soil. It does preserve the relics quite well. And yeah, you don't get too much corrosion on your coins and um, badges and buckles and so forth. So if something's out of the ground. What is it? Oh, look. It's another, is it the edge of a coin? And this one is a penny. It's 
by a slightly higher target ID as you saw. Great stuff. Well, I'm possessed with this drain. Once again, that's uh, got a nice patina, but I can't see the date, and it's too. Uh, I won't clean it out here in the bush. I haven't got the resources to do it. Give it a clean, and we'll do a bit of a wrap up at the end. I just made that comment about uh, not wanting to pinpoint it to be too sensitive. Uh, you see a lot of videos on the internet saying, oh, I can pick up so-and-so with my pinpointer at a certain range and how far away does a pinpointer work and how sensitive it is. That's not the uh, function of a pinpointer. Pinpointer is not to increase your detection field, it's to reduce it. The search call on the detector is what you need to cover large areas. The pinpointer you use to narrow down your detection field. So you don't want your pinpointer detecting targets out at 12 inches. It's pointless. You can do that with a search call. So I put it on minimum sensitivity, not maximum, on the carrot. And that way I reduce my field right down and actually use it as a pinpointer. Because if you don't do that, you're actually using it as a metal detector. You've already got one in your other hand with the big coil on it. So I don't put any uh, credence in this, how far can my pinpointer detect a target. It's pointless. You don't want to increase the range of your pinpointer. You actually want it reduced. So that's how I operate in this situation at least. Here's an interesting uh, World War II relic over here. Look at this old Coke bottle. Might be dated. Just up against the tree. I think they have. Well, what's this? Look at that, New York. New York Coke bottle. Came out here with the American Army, obviously, in uh, 1942. That's a rip of that. Pity there's not more of it. <laughs> a New York World War II Coke bottle. Okay, Collins uh, just got a report. Apex with the big uh, Viper coil. What do we got here? It's, um, it's like the, the military buckle. Someone had dug there and I found the signal over here, so I'm not sure if they dug it and didn't want it or not, but anyway, it's come out. Oh, yeah. It's a military buckle, don't you think? Oh, definitely. Yeah. That's and uh, then there was yeah, a little one. retainer strap or yeah. something that goes around the uh, canvas strap. Mm. Yeah, nice. But so you could hear that really well because you had the double bimp when you're going across it. Oh you yeah, know, of course, it, on the double D coil. Yeah. What was the target ID? Um, in the 50s. Okay. Because I've been digging a lot of um, a lot of lead and iron sort of stuff. Yep. And so, yeah. Okay, nice work. That's a good example of a detectorist. A, not filling in his hole, or her hole, and B, leaving the t missing the actual target. Interesting. Yeah. I've got to show you something else on Apex here. This is where you get the occasional high tone ping as the discriminator looks at a target and then changes its mind, if you like. I know this target's iron because I can see this old bit of uh, angle bracket there. That's definitely World War II. She's pretty corroded. I'd say the rest of it's here. Now, if you watch this, you can see that I've got target IDs in the 19s, 20s. Now, occasionally, see that? It jumped to 71. Get a bit of music going on. But this is going to be iron because if I iron check it, You can hear the iron. I'll just turn up my iron audio there by way of demonstration, which is another great um, iron volume. I already got one. Let's put the iron volume on four. Operate. Yeah, you can hear the iron in there. And then it jumps up now and then because it gets a flat bit of flat band of iron like that. More, and it's thinking, oh, is that any good? No, no, it's not. See, predominantly you're in the 30s there. But now you'll see, now it'll jump to a 70. That'll be a concentration of iron, like a large, can be a chain link or an old horse ring, but that won't be the case here, but here it'll be part of that old angle bracket. That's all iron. Now what about sensitivity? As you can see, well there's eight bars on an apex. That's representing your sensitivity. The, obviously the more bars you've got up, the more sensitive. I've got that on flat out. This soil is fairly neutral. The ground balance is at 85, which is a high ground balance anywhere else, but not here in Australia. So if I look at uh, sensitivity, that's your first option. I've got it on max, and you can run it <clears throat> however you like. Now, obviously, you don't want to run it on one. You want to run this as high as practical in the conditions you're detecting. And that'll probably be dictated by EMI and, uh, and the amount of mineralization in the ground. The beauty of Apex is its ground balance circuit. You've got 175 points of ground balance, so you can tune this to just about any soil on the planet. Uh, as long as you stay on top of your ground balance, you can run your sensitivity quite high, so you're not losing any depth. 
or having to run your sensitivity lower. Okay, I've just caught up with Colleen and we've got some finds here. What have we got? Well, I'm not sure, but I think it might be silver. Okay. Because it's quite heavy. Let's have a look at this. Okay. Oh yeah, that's silver. It's uh, heavy. It's not. Just no, it's heavy. It's not something. alloy. No. That is silver. Now I don't know what that could be. We'll have to clean it up. It looks like. Use, I wonder um, if it's a bit of trench art. I don't think it's a coin, is it? No, I don't think it's a coin. Did they use silver for fillings in teeth or anything? Like in you know how? Oh, uh, like an amalgam. Gold? Yeah. Well, that's one heck of a tooth. No, no, it might be something that they. <laughs> yeah, it's true. A dental amalgam. And, and uh, molded or something. Well, that should Perhaps. that could be. That, it could be exactly what it is, it could be dental and amalgam because there was a hospital area in here that I haven't located exactly. Okay, Colin's found another piece of the New York Coke bottle, which wasn't far away, was it? No. We're just going to find that neck. We're just going to find the neck part. That's pretty awesome. A bit of history that's come all the way from yeah. the east coast of the United States during World War II. Okay, Colin's down here, invisible. Let's go and find out what she's found. She's uh, made an exclamation that there's been a find. Once again, she's on Apex. She is operating in multi-frequency. She started it on 20 kilohertz, but then switched to multi. Um, with the stock Viper coil. What's the report here? Oh, nice. Wasn't very deep. Well, that's an old World War II fork for sure. Oh, that's a US fork. Oh, is it? Yep. You'll find because it's got US on the um, here. Does it say US? Yes, it does. U.S. Army. Yeah, US. What an awesome find. That's pretty cool. Yeah, nice work. I don't think you found one. I found a few of those at that cutlery patch at the other site, but I don't think you found no, a U.S. I've fork, have you? No. That's a ripper. Okay, this one I've already taken off two inches of leaf and topsoil. 76, 77. Very tight uh, and precise target responses you can hear there. Now, very interesting thing here. Put the machine on the ground and I'm getting a bit of EMI. So what I'll do, I'll go through that frequency channel change. Now I've gone to channel 7 and operate and it's gone. Quick and easy way to get rid of that chatter. Okay, let's have a look at the 77 target. That target ID could be a um, rifle round. Yes, for 303 or 3006 in here because it's Australian and American. Oh no, it's not. It's something round. It's something round. And it's a grommet. That's about right for a uh, World War II poncho grommet. Okay, another Colleen find. She's called out one and three eighths. <laughs> What's it a car? Oh, it's a, a circular item. Yeah, it's like a lid or something, but it hasn't got any, you know. It's not Where's the one and three eight? On the top here. Oh yeah, okay. One and three eight. I don't know where that's from. I don't know, that's interesting. Nothing written on the inside. That's a solid yeah, World War II lid. Yeah. One and three eight. No idea, but... Uh, Maybe it was some sort of tube with uh, drill bits or something like that, I don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, we'll research that and see if we can find out what it actually is. It's a nice mystery item. Well, I hope you found that an informative video on using the new Apex to the best advantage. Uh, if you've got any questions about the machine or its settings, uh, please leave a comment and I will reply to it. Uh, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the Garrett Apex. Thanks for watching. This is a high tone too, wasn't it? Yeah, this is a high tone. This is on the tail of the 1 and 3 eighths lid. Yeah, it's right Clearly isn't drill bits, you're not going to have a drill bit 1 and 3 eighths, but I don't know what that would be.